So I'd just like to uh, reintroduce Marie-Claude Landry, uh, not only in terms of what her uh, professional parcours is, but uh, also, if I may, to offer some uh, brief personal reflections before handing the stage to um, the focus of this session. Uh, as you know, Marie-Claude is the Chief Commissioner and CEO of the uh, Canadian Human Rights Commission, and she was appointed in 2015. And under her leadership, uh, and I think this is important for reasons I'll talk about in a moment, she's been given, uh, the Commission's been given under her leadership new and important roles, including under the Accessible Canada Act, the Pay Equity Act, and the National Housing Strategy Act. Now that all sounds very technical, and why does it matter? Um, it matters because for many years, in part as a result of the attacks on human rights commissions, on the development of a human rights culture and generally that were prevalent in that period that I was talking about uh, at the beginning in terms of the human rights wars, there was not sufficient trust in the legitimacy and the institutional uh, validity, if you will, at a social level of human rights commissions for them to be given these new and important responsibilities. And I think the fact that the federal government has decided to uh, give the human rights commission important new responsibilities in areas as critical as accessibility for people with disabilities, uh, pay equity. Canada continues to lag behind uh, many countries, uh, including in the OECD, with regard to uh, parity uh, on the gender front, but of course it does not only include uh, gender, um, and the National Housing Strategy Act. And for those of you who are public policy students, you'll know that housing has become one of the most important uh, public policy issues in Canada, and indeed I would argue uh, in the OECD, uh, among the OECD countries in North America, and particularly in the last couple of years, uh, and to have an organization like the National Housing Advocate named uh, and being responsible for um, that aspect, I think, is is a real uh, validation of and a proof of trust, if you will, in the Canadian Human Rights Commission, which marks a significant change from what was going on 10 to 15 years ago. Her lifelong advocacy for human rights, including women, people with disabilities, Indigenous peoples, uh, 2SLGBTQ+, people, Black and other racialized people, people living in poverty, prisoners, and many more have earned her numerous distinctions, including the ADE, which is uh, one of the, uh, which is the most uh, senior prize that's given uh, by the Barreau du Québec, the Quebec Bar Association, for its uh, for its its lawyers, uh, and among others uh, in the room who may have it, I, I should also mention that uh, Julius Gray is also a holder of the ADE. Um, she also holds, uh, uh, she also created the Marie Claude Landry Prize for Access to Justice by pro bono student Sherbrooke and the title of Person of the Year from the Cowansville and Regional Trust Chamber of Commerce. And as Vincent said earlier, uh, I could go on with the prizes, but I just, before inviting her to come up to the podium, I just want to say um, that there, it really has been since, uh, I would say, the late 80s, early 90s that we've had a chief commissioner of this stature uh, in Canada, not only in C Canada, but also at the international level, who's earned the respect of community organizations, earn the respect of advocates, earn the respect of her colleagues, earn the respect of the media, knows what she's talking about, understands the legal framework, but also understands the policy directions that are necessary. And having all of those in one package, Marie-Claude, has just been an enormous privilege, I think, for all of us uh, as Canadians um, uh, to have this capacity to make sure that the institutional voice uh, it also becomes the human voice, uh, also becomes the voice that reaches us and tells us something about who we are as people and the kind of society that we would like to uh, create. So uh, Marie-Claude, with, with that, uh, I'd like to invite you to come to the podium and share your reflections uh, on the eve of your uh, leaving the post of Chief Commissioner. I encourage you to speak uh, frankly, uh, uh <laughs> but of course, with the usual restrictions. So please. Good afternoon again, and uh, thank you, Pearl. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you for this opportunity of being with uh, all of you uh, today. Uh, we uh, we know each other since a uh, couple of years, and I really appreciate each and every conversation uh, that we had. Uh, it was a privilege to get to know you and have these uh, these uh, 
intimate time with you uh, where we were able to talk about human rights and life and, and human matters. And I hope that uh, it will remain and we will uh, keep in touch, in fact. I would like to add my whole personal gratitude uh, to the uh, Kenyan Kehaka Nation uh, and the custodian of these lands and waters upon which uh, gather today and to the diverse population of indigenous peoples who call what is now known as Montreal their home. For me, the land acknowledgement is much more than a formality. This is a key action that we can take towards reconciliation and share understanding of our past, present, and future. Let me begin by repeating what I say during the panel. Com the Canadian Human Rights Commission acknowledge and respects the Supreme Court uh, of Canada decision in Ward case. What I said, I'm still deeply concerned by the possible repercussion of this decision. People may take away from that decision that and the media coverage around it, that a message that is acceptable in our society to mock children, to ridicule them in public, to make fun of people with disability. It is not. And what I said before, it may be lawful, but it's awful. And we must say so. And we must, we must stand and say so and repeat it. Publicly ridiculing people with disabilities invites further harmful behavior. It creates barriers to meaningful participation in public life and in society. For children, they can harm their healthy development sense of self and dignity. The damage is real and lasting. It causes suffering and, dev and can, devastate, can devastate young people's lives. And threatening children, treating with, uh, children with respect and dignity is not just a good idea. Canada has ratified both United Nations Convention of the, on the Rights of Children and the United Nations Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. This means that Canada has made a promise, to haul, a promise to haul children, including children with disabilities, to uphold their rights and to protect them from exploitation, violence, and abuse. And we all must fulfill this promise. Children are amongst the most vulnerable people in Canada, and we must treat them with care, dignity, and respect. They trust us. They trust that we have their best interest at heart. It is on this point that I would like to elaborate for a moment. On having our children's interests at heart. As a mother, as a grandmother, as the head of the Canadian Human Rights Commission, as a human being. Because I believe that we are in a pivotal time in our history, a critical moment. The convergence of pervasive internet, smartphones, and social media has been disruptive force. It has transformed how we communicate, how we share information, and how we learn about the world around us. It has brought the world's knowledge to our fingertips, but it has also pushed limits of public discourse to the raw edge of what is acceptable blurring the line of what is offensive, what is harmful, and what is hateful. It has brought hate into our daily life, lives. While this influx of 24-7 media is shocking and concerning to those, to those of us who remember life before the internet, it is normal for our children. It is what they are growing, growing up with. It is how they are discovering the world around them and seeking out information. What children are seeking online are seeing online will become the social norms and that will support their sense of right and wrong and guide their behavior as they reach adulthood. It is alarming. We are even hearing reports of children in Canada picking up extreme misinformation that denies the Holocaust from anonymous users on Instagram, Snapchat, and TikTok. This is now an urgent human rights matter. 
And so that is why today I will focus my remark on hate and harmful speech. More specifically, I will touch on three key points. First, there is a legal gap in protection against hate speech in Canada. Second, the gap in legal protection and advances in technology have allowed aid to faster and spread. And third, effectively compa combating hate will take a comprehensive regime that is coordinated, proactive, and government-led. Throughout my nearly eight years as a Chief Commissioner of Canada's National Human Rights Institution, we have been outspoken about the harms on hate, of hate and intolerance in our society. Balancing the right to freedom of expression and the right to live free from aid has always been a highly charged and challenging issue. And it remains as complex as ever. In my view, this is why aid speech has been left to flourish for the past decade. No one wants to touch this issue. Successive governments have tried to get it right, but the problem has only gotten worse. I do not believe we can ignore the problem anymore, and any longer. Here is why. Hate is a threat to public safety. I mentioned it this morning. It's a threat to democracy and is a threat to human rights. Hate speech violates a person's most basic human rights and freedoms, the right to equality and to freedom of, of, from discrimination. And Canada has a duty to implement laws to ensure that human rights are adequately protected, respected, and fulfilled. Canada's Supreme Court has recognized the need to pro protect minority groups from the intolerance and psychological pain caused by communications such as aid, such as aid propaganda. The court has also stated recently that other forms of expression, which may technically fall outside the definition of hate speech, can still put people in Canada in the position of having to argue for their basic humanity or social standing. Realizing this, we have no choice, no choice, but to rethink, re-examine, and reconsider whose expression needs more protection in today's society, which value we are protecting. When aid makes young people shy away from their social lives, when it deters meaningful public participation, when it scares people from political involvement, it is the victims of freedom of expression that is being harmed. It is a democratic freedoms it is democratic freedoms is being harmed. We need our young people's voices now more than ever. To participate in our society and our politics is in an important ways. After all, they are our future and the next generation of human rights defenders. But if they are intimidated by hateful expression, we may lose their critical voices. Canada's Supreme Court takes a nuanced approach on this. They have already said that not all expression is created equal. equal. Freedom of expression is not a one-way street where eight has the right of way. The drafters of the Canada's Constitution and the drafters of the 1948 Universal Declaration of Human Rights were not seeking to protect the rights of those who mean to harm others. They put this into writing. People who seek to harm others cannot use human rights to defend this behavior. This is why when it comes to balancing the need to combat hate and harmful speech, with the need to protect freedom of expression, our lawmakers must do, must do more, much more. The Commission's perspective in this area dates back to the hate speech provision under the former Section 13 of the Canadian Human Rights Act. 
Section 13 originally, originally allows, allowed someone to file a complaint regarding eight messages on the 1-800 telephone numbers. Following the attack on September 11, Parliament amended Section 13 to include eight messages communicated over the Internet. Even then, Section 13 was not sufficient. One of our legal consuls, one compared it to trying to empty an o the ocean with a spoon. From the first days of Internet, communities targeted by hate called for stronger laws. Instead, in 2013, this section of Canada's federal human rights laws was repealed. As a result, one of the only legal options to fight hate was taken away. Since then, those who promote hate speech continue with fewer or no consequences at all. The impacts of these changes have not only been legal, but also social. It is emboldened those who argue that freedom of expression is absolute and that there should be no legal accountability for spreading hate. Their views gained traction, their groups gained followers, and their movements gained momentum. I think most of us will agree that the remaining legal criminal code option is of a little help. This brings me to my second point, that the gap in legal protection and advances in technology have allowed aid to fester and spread. Today, online hate is easier to find, harder to ignore, and impossible to avoid. The internet has given everyone the power to be a broadcaster. Hate spreads quickly and organically within the help of both algorithm and clickbait. Now, companies can host and promote online hate in Canada and around the world with almost no legal accountability. Hate is being used to isolate, mob, and overwhelm individuals online. Behavior that was unacceptable in real life has gained acceptance online. And this lead to real world arms. In recent years, we have seen numerous devastating examples. Online hate has led to violence, to threats and harassment, to murders and massacres. And it, and this, is, this creates fears. It leaves painful marks, psychological trauma, in the heart and the minds of victims and onlookers. So even when hate does not end in physical violence, it's still deeply, deeply, profoundly harmful to victims in society. It bolsters stereotypes, reinforces prejudice, and it dehumanizes people. In this way, it makes discrimination easier and more acceptable. Today, hate has been monetized and politicized. It's now big business and big politics. Many are willing to ignore the arms caused by hate and that because there is money to be made and power to be gained by exploiting, by exploiting, exploiting it. Those who promote hate have found new allies, new networks, and new money in Canada and around the world. Hate is part of a coordinate, coordinated misinformation campaigns that divide and distract us. Hate contributes to an erosion of trust in public institutions and science. The people spreading hate are also distorting human rights principles to justify their actions. And this is wrong. This is very wrong. In order to protect human rights, we must be sure that people understand them. We need to do more 
to make it clear that rights come with responsibilities and that nobody, nobody can stand behind rights, protections to justify arming others. As I mentioned earlier, this is a complex and challenging issue. In some cases, hate has found its way into mainstream political debates with an alarming mask of credibility. In this way, hate turns us against each other and destabilized our democracy. It shuts down debate. It silences people, including our children. And it discourages people from participating in the political process. And we know that we are not insulated from what is happening around the world. Online aid has no border. It is often created and promoted by communities that, that are connected worldwide. It is gal galvanizing in the absence of any accountability. Canada should be looking to events in other democracies as a cautionary tale. And now, let's bring me to my third and final point today. Combating hate will take a comprehensive regime that is coordinated and proactive. <laughs> and it must be bold. It must foster dignity, equality, and freedom of expression. But not just for some, for everyone. Canada should be seen by the world as a leader. Tackling the issue of aid must never fall to one organization alone, nor should the honors fall on those targeted by aid. It will take all of us, practitioner, academia, civil society, and human rights commissions. A new regime needs to understand and address the root causes of aid. And it, it must understand the complexity of the communication tools used to spread it, not to mention that it happened in real life spaces. It must hold accountable those who create, spread, and profit from hate. This requires strong oversight, audit, and meaningful monetary penalties. But if there is no shift in culture and what we consider as the norm, these measures, laws, etc., will just be word on paper. And so, a new regime must include information campaigns and prevention. It must identify and encounter disinformation and misinformation. We know this task is difficult and highly complex. It will not be perfect, but we do not have the luxury to wait of being perfect. Not at all. It must be done as soon as possible. Now, concrete action need to be taken. Solutions must take aid seriously. They must address aid for the very real threat that it poses. A threat to public safety, a threat to democracy, and a threat to human rights. Without a comprehensive new regime, aid will continue to violate human rights. If people in Canada targeted by hate have to live their li lives afraid in, and in a toxic social atmosphere, we are failing them deeply. Without the stronger legal protections and collective action, hate will continue to infest and influence our public and political discourse. As I mentioned at the beginning of my remarks, our children are watching us and learning as hate, dis disinformation, and violence are normalized more and more and more each day, each month, and each year. So we must continue to push for change and continue to sound the alarm. We all have a duty as citizens to speak out on hate, now more than ever. Just keep in mind the two minutes that I asked you earlier to take and think about that. We must not be silence in face of gross violation of human rights. Silence make us complicit. Silence and indifference 
are incubator for injustice. So we have a duty to speak out, to stand up. We have a duty to raise awareness on how hate is being used today in the same way that it always been used in the history's darkest corners as a tool of propaganda and division. And we especially have the duty to keep calling for action from our governments on this issue for the sake of a safer Canada for all, for the sake of our young people, for the sake of young Mr. Gabriel. Regardless of the Supreme Court's decision or whether the comedian had the legal right to bully, ridicule a child with a disability, society failed Mr. Gabriel. We failed Mr. Gabriel. We may never fully comprehend the harm caused to him and to his family. But we do know that the terrible jokes about him reached an audience of over well of well over 100,000 people followed him to school online and caused him to contemplate suicide. In the end, the human rights system left him and his family alone to argue for his basic humanity and social standing. We can and must do better as a, as a society but we cannot do it alone. Since the start of my mandate, I have said over and over and over again that I believe in the power of coalitions, how amazing things can happen when a group of people come together to do good. At the Commission, we call it advocacy through coalition. It is about working towards a common purpose, using our combined voices to increase awareness. And so, in all of this work to combat hate in Canada and to promote greater awareness about this urgent issue, partnerships will be the key. We need to pull together and share our networks and share our expertise. In events like this, in close conversations, in open dialogue, with diverse voices around the table, we need to support each other because we all have a role to play. In closing, I was recently asked by an audience how I feel about the direction of our country on all these issues. I answer honestly that I have huge concerns, but I also have hope. I say that I have huge concern when I see the insidious spread of hateful rhetoric into so many areas of our lives. But I have hope when I see young people taking the streets to stand up for justice. And I wonder, maybe we need both in the fight against hate. Our fear to spur us into action and our hope to sustain us on a journey. I know that whatever the journey may bring, that the Canadian Human Rights Commission will still be there, sounding the alarm, raising these issues, shining a light into the dark corners. And though I know I now depart of my role as Chief Commissioner, I will still be there as the greatest champion always, as I, as I know that many of you will, be, will do as well. Because alone we can do little, but together we can do so much. And as I close, I would like to take a moment to share a poem that I think captures everything we have spoken about today. It is a poem by Saidi, and it goes. Human beings are members of a whole. In creation of one essence and one soul, if one member is afflicted with pain, other members uneasy will remain. If you have no sympathy for human pain, the name of human you cannot retain. Thank you.
Merci beaucoup, Marie-Claude. So you will have seen that uh, we didn't uh, have questions at the end of the last session. I wanted to make sure, we all wanted to make sure that you had the opportunity to think about and digest these various ideas. And so what I would like to do now is we still have about half an hour left. And so from the last couple of sessions, or indeed if it's something from the beginning, ideas or thoughts that you've had from any of the discussions we have left as we had promised to do when we organized this conference, ample time for folks to weigh in, give their thoughts. You can, for any of the speakers who are in the room, of course, you're free to direct your questions uh, to them um, as well. So I'm going to open the floor and I think I'd just just like to start because we missed them the last time online Cassandra is there anything you'd like to uh, share yeah so we've got um, two questions online if I can shoot maybe the first one yeah so um, the first one is from Zara um, they ask are we seeing a movement away from legal frameworks government policy and formal institutions due to a lack of trust by society members and further uh, fractioning into social groups um, and do we think that's assisting in fracturing a cohesive society or is it beneficial in creating a more cohesive society in creating these groups. For example, they draw on um, the BLM protests or Black Lives Matter protests that began in the USA um, and have now spread globally. And the second? The second comes from Corey, uh, who had a, a bit of a technical question from Ward. Um, they asked, can't the Human Rights Commissions themselves read down the Ward decision to be applicable only to certain contexts? Example, public performance in the context of a humorous show. It seems to me that the distinction is fair, and in order to get another Supreme Court decision, you have to get there, i.e. Human Rights co Commissions should test the ground by accepting a complaint and taking it to the Supreme Court. Philippe André, that one's going to be for you. <laughs> but we're going we're gonna to give him a second to think about it. And... and, uh, and um, uh, the idea of fracturing social cohesion, I think, resonates with something Julie had said at the beginning, which is which is the the danger of identity politics here, the danger of uh, uh, sensitivity to the point that people do feel meaningfully constrained in their speech. Uh, these are real concerns. Uh, at the same time, they are uh, quite distinct from quite distinct from the kinds of harms I think that we've been talking about throughout this conference, and I think there are distinctions to be made between them. But I'd like to invite any of the speakers uh, who, uh, or indeed anybody else in the audience who would like to respond to that first question about whether or not we're engaged in creating, fostering um, uh, divisions that in fact decrease our social cohesion. Any takers? The problem is the cohesions, the divisions are already here. And the real division, the real problem, uh, I really believe that the most important problem behind everything we've been talking about is the change that occurred in Western society around 1980 when the Trente Glorieuse, the 30 years of social democracy ended and the neoliberals took over, cut the public system and uh, they're including, for instance, uh, the judicial system where people can't afford justice anymore. And I think much of the hate that you see online and everywhere else is people who are frustrated when they think they're losing access to very limited resources. I do not think that uh, we will solve the problem unless we turn away from neoliberalism, unless we make justice accessible to all, and unless we recognize the freedom of all of us to challenge the basic rules in the society. See, when we say that we have to be so careful about democracy, uh, uh, diversity, and so on, you're taking for granted the regime as we have it now. Suppose, and I'm not going to be the last person to, 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 to suggest anything racist or dis discriminatory, but suppose you believe, as I actually do, that greater integration and less multiculturalism would be better. In other words, more uh, um, uh, creation of a single society uh, with people going to school and so on together. Unless it, it's not dangerous in any way to say that, people will not say that. So the real problem is the scarcity of resources, the scarcity of judicial resources, the growing poverty and that leads to competition between different lobbies, groups, identity groups for those resources. And it prevents us from advancing. So it's 
turn away from 1980 is what's necessary. A move back towards the Tante Glorieuse. <laughs> Thanks very much. Uh, I've got a light in my eyes, so I can't see. Vincent, was that a hand? Yes, yeah. if I can just address the question again. It, it came up around trust, that, that term, and is there a lack of trust in public institutions right now? And that's why things aren't getting done. Things are going to get done if there's political will at the end of the day. And it's tough because it's almost like a chicken and egg question because um, there is a threat to social cohesion right now, but I think governments are afraid that if they push in certain directions, they could make it worse. So online harm is a perfect example, and it's why nothing's happening. There's paralysis because they fear if they go too far, the platforms are going to come back and, and hammer them. There's going to be a public outcry. If they don't go far enough at the other end of the spectrum, it's and so they feel like they just can't move. Um, it's going to take political will. And trying to jam through major, major changes like that, I, I mean, being purely, I'm not being political, but I'm, I'm bringing the political dynamic into it, trying to jam through a major, major initiative like that at the end of a political term right before an election, <laughs> it ain't going to work. If they're going to have to do something, you do it at the beginning of a mandate, you go hard to the net, and you take your hit. And, and I hope that's what they do with online harm, although you know we're already, what, a year into a new mandate, and it hasn't, it hasn't shown up yet. Thanks very much. Um, before we move to, I'm going to invite Philippe André to answer the second question, but before we move to that, I just wanted to respond to something Philippe André had talked about earlier around Bill 59 and the background to some of this uh, discussion with regard to Quebec's attempt uh, to regulate in the area of hate. Uh, I was on the um, uh, Quebec Bar Association's delegation to the Commission des Institutions at the time when the bill was being debated. And one of the, th uh, and, and we were actually, as, as you may recall, uh, against Bill 59 as well. But the reasons had nothing to do with the importance of, um, or at least that aspect of it, uh, had nothing to do with opposing uh, the, the, pr the, had nothing to do with opposing the, the importance of having legislative sanctions with hate. It was just a terrible bill. It was a bill that just made no sense, and from a machinery standpoint, I remember thinking that the commission was going to be actually in an impossible situation uh, under the bill. But, but you know, clarity in legislative drafting and making sure that your law is actually doing what it's trying to do in an effective way is a pretty important piece of the policy uh, policy agenda. So I'm going to ask uh, uh, Nav maybe to pass you the uh, mic on the second question. Yeah, well, I won't give a complete answer for sure, but if I can address your point that you just made you know regulating speech is hard and you just gave an example for those of you who want to look about the debates about section 13 or, or uh, bill uh, 59 uh, or around 2015 google it and you'll find a lot of public debate on for example is this the right mechanism the, who who actually deals with that you need to have a system that actually effectively deals with these kinds of complaints so all of that has to be taken into account because you can't just promise the public you'll regulate hate speech and then do you know don't give the tools or the proper tools to actually do so. Um, so um, uh, you know, uh, le legislating is a very difficult. And to come back to Julia's point, uh, in the Trente Glorieuse, we were creating institutions from scratch, um, and I uh, it's not easy. But it's a much more complex thing to do than enact new legislation when these institutions are already there. And the conflict is not whether or not to create things, but which one should supersede the other, or which right, or so that, that, that makes it even more difficult. So uh, we're in an uh, era of complexity on these kinds of issues. Uh, and so um, stay tuned for the next decision from the Supreme Court on hate speech. It might not come from Quebec. It might come from another province. The, the, the Watcott decision was a Saskatchewan Human Rights Commission uh, anti-hate uh, speech provisions in Watcott. Uh, uh, Stephanie talked about the Schrenk case. Schrenk was a BC case. So this is not a Quebec thing. It's a universal, universal thing, at, and actually you know, it's a Canadian thing. So we might see a, a case coming from another province that will put in jeopardy the reasoning behind Ward. So we'll be, uh, as I said, uh, closely staying tuned, uh, you know, clo closely listening to those kinds of uh, decisions. So for the policy students in the room, you will note the question he didn't answer. 
Uh, so, so <laughs> institutions, institutions, uh, and, and the heads of institutions generally aren't in the business of responding to court decisions by telling the courts that they're going to do their jobs for them. Um, and so, uh, as the head of a human rights institution, it wouldn't have been uh, appropriate uh, to say, "Well, we're just going to pay no attention to the Supreme Court's decision because it was a humor case." And I'm not speaking for we've not had this conversation before. Um, but but commissions that have quasi-judicial functions are really in a unique and often very difficult position trying to navigate uh, their judicial functions, their public promotion functions, not being able to speak about cases that are before them or that have already been rendered uh, because they're actually uh, in a position of undermining their own legitimacy when they're speaking publicly about these cases. And I think it's important to, to underscore that. Uh, and again, we did not have a complot or a conspiracy uh, about this from before. For, but but having worked uh, spent a bit of time in the Human Rights Commission and working with commissions around the world, um, it's certainly something that comes up over and over and over again. Okay, anybody else have any questions for any of the participants? Rob. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Robert Yalden, and um, uh, I wanted to start. Uh, with a quick observation, and then I do have a question for Marie-Claude and for, uh, for Philippe André. So <coughs> most people have, will have forgotten by now, but maybe 30 years ago or so, my father was the head of the Canadian Human Rights Commission. I've only crossed paths a couple of times with you, Marie-Claude, um, uh, Marie but I, um, I did want to take this opportunity to say I watched you from a distance. I know how hard the role is. I watched what my father had to go through. I think it's got harder and harder. Um, so I, I know... Um, and commend you for the job you've done. Um, you've, you've served with distinction. Um, and I think you do very well uh, in the speech today to raise what is an enormous new challenge for the commissions. Um, you, you've observed a couple of times that um, everyone's a broadcaster now. I wonder if, if we shouldn't qualify that slightly uh, by observing that everyone gets access to the broadcast system. But the broadcaster, in a way, is this megaphone that, is, um, that are these social platforms. And the heart of these social platforms are algorithms that um, are commercially driven and are um, designed uh, to um, propagate, amplify what, what uh, gets traction, what's popular with people. And unfortunately, hate seems to be popular. Um, I'd be really interested in your thoughts uh, and... Uh, and Philippe André, who similarly has a very challenging job. Your thoughts on what are regulatory strategies? What are tools for constraining the way in which these algorithms are developed? Can one get in there and do that? Or does one have, is one limited to just trying to regulate the company itself? And I know all of this is that much harder because they all, they're offshore, right? They're a lot of these things. So um, anyhow, any further thoughts, just digging a bit deeper on, on uh, practical solutions or regulatory strategies that, that might be being talked about to tackle something that is a, a really, uh, I, th I think we're becoming more and more conscious of how, how big a problem this is. Not an easy question, I know. <laughs> and by the way, just sorry, just a quick parenthesis for the public. Uh, for the students in the room or anybody interested about these very interesting questions about Human Rights Commission, please read Pearl's book. Very, very good book. Uh, <laughs> if you don't know about it, if you haven't, if she haven't, hasn't put it in her course uh, th to read, please read it. It's a very important book to, to have in your head if you want to understand the, the legal framework around uh, Human Rights Commissions. and. So, um, and Christmas is coming up. It'll make an excellent yeah. stocking yeah. stuffer. <laughs> Yeah, so we didn't talk about that either before. So yeah, so no royalties for me. Um, so just that, that that being said, um, e algorithms and you know what we call artificial intelligence and all these new buzzwords uh, that are out there and all the technology implications um, are, for example, a, a very concrete example that we're facing. So the uh, insurance industry, the insurance industry uses all kinds of tools and there's been again for the google it in, in insurance industry algorithms there's a whole lot of discussion about what are the proper ways to actually insure people based on risk based on personal characteristics there's actually a provision in the quebec human charter about that an exception to certain rights 
because you need to be able to discriminate people, and I'm putting, I'm quoting, you know, uh, on guillemets, people because you're actually insuring some risk. But then when you go and insure uh, risk based on personal characteristic and then you affect that right to equality, then you go beyond that threshold. And these, uh, these, these systems and these tools uh, will be uh, very complex tools. So there's not a whole lot of people that actually go into these models. You need to have experts in mathematics in that actuaria, actuaria, actuary, actuarial. actuarial services. So these are very, very complex in way, the way they are designed. And the other thing that we must remind ourselves, and there's been a lot of talk about this, is the fact that the this, this, this social media, they put us in the, um, dans les, dans les chambres d'écho, echo chambers. So we have, because the algorithms will make it so that you only see things that you like and friends like. So you're actually not in a discussion with other, and relating to the point of Marie-Claude, and I, that was very, we have to talk to each other a bit more and across these cones of silence, across these echo chambers. And that's hard to do in a society where everybody lives and dies for this. So, um, uh, and my children, the first. So I have to remind, remind my, everybody in the room who has kids, please stop, please, I, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a very, very difficult social thing to do, individually, socially, collectively, because it's much more easier to click and click and click and not think and not discuss and not confront each other's position. I actually enjoy talking with Julius even though I don't agree with him. But I'm actually more intelligent because I'm talking Julius because I don't agree with him. If you only talk with people that always agree with you, and I know if you, you've heard that a hundred thousand times, but please, please go and talk with somebody that doesn't think the same thing you do and maybe doesn't come from the same culture, but dans la même langue. Try to do that sometimes. You'll be amazed. Yeah, thank you for your question, and it's a very difficult one. And, and certainly, uh, it's, it's for the parliament to uh, do legislation, certainly, but as I think that as a Canadian Human Rights Commission, as human rights institution, uh, in, institution in this country, our role is making sure that when government are looking at legislations, they are doing that with the human rights lens. And they engage with rights holders. And I I'm, I'm on purpose use the word engaged, because I think that we're consult often, but we do not engage often. And I think that this is really key is to talk with the rights holders, understand the phenomenon, understand the impacts, and, and try to see how they can build legislation that will have this human rights lens. And they also need to make sure that they can measure as well and collect proper data to measure what happened, the success of uh, legislation, if their such legislation is, adapted, uh, is adopted, and because this is the only way that things will advance. And I fully agree with my colleague, uh, my colleague Philippe André. I always say that, you know, it's good to talk to a room of converted people, but this is not where is the most efficient to do so. We need to have conversation with people with, who have some uh, different views of us and try to find common grounds and understand each other. It's great to have conversation with people who stand with you and are converted, they can spread the world and the uh, words and, and they can uh, mobilize others, but we need to have these conversation uh, with people who may have different views in order to find solutions that will have a real impact. I want to invite, if I may, uh, Mohammed, to reflect maybe with us a little bit on this conversation from the perspective of the Canadian Race Relations Foundation and uh, their perspective on what we should be thinking about in terms of the uh, regulation of broadcasting online platforms, their implications for hate. What are you hearing in your organization and across the country? Well, <coughs> I can actually start off by answering one of the online questions, if that's okay, because I think that there was a comment made in terms of how our community is responding to a lack of movement from institutions to be able to support them, and what, and what role BLM has taken in terms of being able to, to move the bar forward. Um, and so I want to first say that I think that you know, BLM has been 
uh, the most effective civil rights movement of this generation. I think that the way it has moved public discourse and opinion, it has moved governments, it has moved corporations, it's moved organizations to act and take um, substantially new different approaches towards uh, addressing anti-black racism in particular. But once you, when you're addressing one form of racism, such as anti-black racism, everybody else benefits too. So I think that the work that they've done has dramatically uh, helped Canada. Um, in terms of, and I also agree uh, with, with Julius in terms of being able to have conversation with disagreement that's civil. Um, I, I really despise cancel culture, to be honest. I, I, I think we gotta keep room for people to come back. You know, I, I, I can, there was, a, there was a journalist who wrote a nasty hit piece about me. And then he, and I got like death threats, people like harassing me on the street because of that. And then I ran into him and I'm like, yo, that was a jerk move. <laughs> <laughs> and like, you should know what that did to me. And he apologized. And like we know each other and we talk to each other and I like, completely disagree with everything he says. He still writes, but but that but that level of civility needs to exist for people to come back in. I think that like we need to change the le I agree with you in terms of how advocacy has also changed. I think that advocacy you're right has played a role in terms of shifting and uh, but I also don't think that we complained about advocacy when there was no advocacy from, uh, from marginalized communities. And I think that now that they have a more amplified access to, to power and to, and to voice, that I think that that seems threatening. Mm -hmm. and, and I find, and I take issue to that. Because I think that when people were silenced and couldn't say much, and now when they're not, or we find that offensive, is a bit, it's a bit hard to swallow. Um, but I also think that in terms of like online hate and how like um, I just like the, the issue really, to be honest, is about volume um, and the speed by which things are moving. The commercialization, as Philippe Andre said, is incredibly important. But I think that from a race perspective, it's um, there's disproportionate harm in this environment. There's, there just is. You know, women, young women in particular, are the greatest recipients uh, of hate online today. And there's just, there's no debating that. So how do we, how do we not fail Gabrielle's? How do we not fail the next generation? Um, and I think that we gotta plug just the volume of it. And, and as Marie-Claude said, it's not just about one online harm solution or bill or it's not just about one decision in the courts. I think there's a multitude of different factors and all of us are working towards finding some of those small solutions everywhere. Thanks very much. I just wanna let people know, uh, we also have a section set up on the website for this conference with resources that have been put together on the concepts of div dignity. What is discrimination? A uh, case law that has looked at the word decision and applied it. Cassandra, uh, who's with us today, has uh, put together some of those resources. Uh, and Sokema, who's online, uh, one of our colleagues here at Max Bell, uh, has also assisted. So please do use those resources online. And I just want to flag that one of them is uh, also on the subject of Christmas books. Um, Pa pa Pablo uh, uh, has a, a couple of books, one, one already done and one I think in the hopper uh, with uh, Oxford University Press on dignity and human rights and dignity on social justice. So those of you who are interested in uh, exploring these ideas earlier, I would urge you to do so because he offers a, a rich and I think quite unique, I don't think that there's anybody else uh, uh, who has, uh, at least in English, um, explored these concepts at this level of depth and complexity. So I really would urge everyone to have a look. I've only had the chance to read a couple of the chapters, but uh, they've, they've been a pleasure to read and, and really interesting. So I'd encourage you to look at those as well. Cassandra, anything online? Okay, anybody else in the room? Anything you'd like to raise? Yes, please, Anne Catherine. Absolutely. 
Thanks very much, Matt. Go ahead, Nim Deloisi and Catherine, Nin Megamo, Nin Megamo, Ach Alasio. Hi, everyone. My name is Aunt Catherine. Um, I'm going to ask my question in English because I might like Mr. Hashim to weigh in on it. But Stephanie, Philippe Henri, and Marie-Claude, feel free to answer in French as well. So essentially, oh, Jesus, sorry, I'm a bit nervous. <laughs> Whew, okay. Um, my question essentially is there was a lot of talk about the lack of trust and distrust in public institutions. And my question is, how do we repair that? How do we reinstore or simply instore trust back into public institutions when essentially they're built on the back of BIPOC, especially indigenous people, talking from an indigenous perspective? So how do we do that? What can we do actually to reinstore or simply instore, particularly indigenous perspective again, trust back into those public institutions. Thank you for this question, and it's a very important one. And, and certainly trust is really a rod in, in, in f for public institution, and it, it needs to be addressed because it's also a threat to democracy when people are not trusting our public institutions. And what I have done since uh, I arrived at the commission and before in my community involvement, it's to listen, learn, and take action. And this is what we need to do, is to listen to them, not to answer, really listen, and learn, and be humble, and be ready to be vulnerable and admit that we don't know what we don't know and we don't know everything. And as well, we need to engage. Stop consulting, engage with people. It means that having a conversation with rights holders and people who do not believe in public institutions because we consult with them at large, but we do not engage with them. We bring them with solutions instead of building solutions with them. I'm seeing that. This is what I think that should be done to build credibility in public institutions. Yeah, just another book to read for your Christmas list. Um, there is a publication made by the, uh, the the Commission des droits de la personne et des droits de la jeunesse and the Institut Sacre Pêche uh, de Wachat Maliotenam, the Nation et nous, qui s'appelle en français Mete Realité sur les peuples autochtones. Uh, in English, it's uh, Aboriginal People, Fact and Fiction. You can find it for free on the website of the cdpdj.qc.ca. Um, so both in French and in English. Um, because one of the things that has changed in the, and this comes from the author and the, uh, the, the, the people that, are, are, that were around the redaction of that, uh, the, 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 that book, were uh, they're noticing, uh, uh, um, in Quebec you know about the Révolution Tranquille, a lot of people are talking about la Révolution Tranquille des, des peuples autochtones au Canada, évidemment plus au Québec, dans mon cas à moi, qui, 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 qui a la juridiction ici. And we're seeing this empowerment, we're seeing this voice, we're seeing this all in the, in the arts, in the media, um, in the education system. The, the, there has been a transformation of the way that the uh, 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 Premières Nations, the Inuit, in Quebec, are perceived, are compris, are viewed. That culture change is tranquil, it's a revolution tranquil, but it's happening. We can actually see it happening. We can see it in the response from the institution. I'm not saying everything's perfect. That's that's not the, my point. I'm saying you can. You're we're noticing these changes. We're noticing this empowerment also, and there is uh, the, this this voice that's being now put there, and everybody's kind of noticing it. Where before, no, you know, it wasn't noticed. It was just invisible. So by making something visible also is very important. And to that, I relate to what Mohammed said: is the the fact that all of a sudden all these minority voices are are being heard. And, oops, oh yeah, it's, yeah, well, well whoa, yeah, 
you know, they have all these revendications and they're asking of all this stuff. Yeah, yeah, wow, okay, yeah, well, it's because before they were there, they were just, they were hurt, okay? So hearing these voices is a fir the first start, is the start of something, is the first start of something. So um, that's, that's the name. And I just wanted to say to Robert, I'm sorry about that. Um, we actually, for the online thing, we just en engage with Facebook and Kijiji because what we're noticing is that people are using Facebook and Kijiji to do rental, um, uh, des annonces pour des logements, okay? And they're saying all kinds of discriminatory stuff. And <laughs> so we're, we can't just each and every one, you know, so we're writing to the co those companies. You have this uh, company policy that says you can't do this, that, that. So we've noticed this, this, this. Please take them off your website. Make sure that your algorithms actually fight the good fight and take these things off your website. So just, I just want to, okay. So uh, sorry about that, but I just remember that question. Um, um, I don't and I, I will just surf on what uh, Marie-Claude and Philippe André just said, but I think to um, uh, rebuild that trust, you have to be able to find yourself in the institution. So knowing that people, indigenous people, or people from every um, ev ev background, thank you, are working there. And I feel, um, je me sens privilégiée d'avoir des collègues de tous les horizons parce que j'apprends à travers eux et c'est eux qui me sensibilisent à une réalité qui autrement m'échapperait. Et là, je fais le lien avec ce que Philippe André disait, « You have to be open-minded, you have to learn from others, even though you don't agree with them, but you have to listen to them. You learn more, more by listening than by repeating what you already know. » That's it's a big question because you know. <laughs> no, because I, I mean, I, I, when I asked the question, "Do you report hate crimes?" If I um, I remember um, meeting an indigenous group who was doing reconciliation work with the they brought together like churches and survivors, uh, and we were funding this program. So we were meeting with them to talk about what I was like. Do you report? And they're like, no, no, no. We have a mama bear clan. We just have an alternate police service, essentially. Like, because there was that lack of trust in the cops. This is in Winnipeg. So, like, obviously. Not obviously. I'm not saying obviously, but Winnipeg. <laughs> um, but I, I think that, you know, in terms of both reconciliation for indigenous communities, First Nations, Inuit, and Metis, uh, Everybody is on a different level of that journey. I think the expectation for institutions to work um, is a, a long period of time. Like we can't look at, the, they, they're not working today, they're gonna work tomorrow as an expectation. There's, you know, what I've learned being institutionalized in an institution <laughs> <laughs> is that the institution won't trust you. Uh, or your voice if you're not also committed to building the institution. So like as public policy students, I'm sure you're all wondering like, God, man, I gotta work for maybe a federal government or provincial <laughs> government after like getting a public policy degree. And man, that's gonna, that's gonna be wild. But I think that um, those institutions are not going to get better without you. Like understand that they're not gonna hear those perspectives and does that mean you got to suck it up and kind of be there for a while? Uh, yeah, <laughs> that does mean that, yeah. But that, does that also, like, but honestly, I have more faith in your generation than, because like you guys don't take shit, <laughs> which is amazing. Like my generation did take more. <laughs> Sorry for the language. <laughs> um, but like, like, so I think that there needs to be ownership of it. We gotta take, like, if you take ownership of a problem, then you're seen with trust to solve it. Uh, and I think that this country, right across from coast to coast to coast, different communities are at different stages of building their sense of ownership uh, of the issue because the pain that they, many of them still feel like their hand is on top of a candle and, is, and they're under fire. And if your hand is burning, you don't look, you can't 
you can't stand above there to say, oh, I need to fix this public policy issue. You just want the pain to stop. And I think that the, the degree of height of your hand away from the fire is very, is very present for every different community across this different country, across the country. So I just, I want to recognize that. Uh, and I think that the only way we're going to get trust in institutions back is for the institutions to work for, for everyone. And that's going to include you as a solution. That feels like a fantastic place to close this conference. Uh, thank you very much, Mohamed, and thank you to uh, Marie-Claude, uh, Philippe, Vincent, and others who have responded, uh, Julius and others who have responded in this session. Uh, big thank you uh, to the staff, Antoinetta, Cassandra, who's been working with us, Sokema, who's online, um, Clarissa, <laughs> Nav, of course, uh, who has been handling the communications, Weston, who's been working with us. Uh, we've just had an incredible uh, group of people supporting this, so thank you very much. Uh, thank you for joining us, those online as well as those who stayed in the room Friday afternoon after the time we said we were going to close. I'm very grateful. Thank you for coming. Um, C'est très gentil. Thank you very much, Meg. Which uh, à la prochaine. Thank you. <laughs>